What is going on, guys? Happy Wednesday. Uh, right now, in the background, somebody new. Uh, so this is Peter, and he actually runs a podcast I just learned about called the Reef News Network, which is pretty cool. So I love finding new sources for the hobby, so I was actually taking the dog for a walk today and listening to it. Yeah, some good stuff, so definitely check it out. Peter has been in the hobby for, what was it, 20 years now, you said? Yeah, 20 years on and off, and my most recent all-in is a, you know four or five years now. Excellent. So you're you're pretty hard into the hobby too. You when we were talking earlier, you have a, a lot of tanks. So it sounds like you've definitely got the saltwater bug in you. Uh, without a doubt, probably uh, probably I don't know three three hundred gallons or so in the house of various tanks. <laughs> nice. And how many tanks are you are you up to? Uh, one, two, three, four tanks running, and just picked up a new sixty gallon cube to do a, a clown harem build with. <laughs> nice. That would be pretty awesome. Uh, in the chat, we got TMG, Wayne Scott's in here, Retro Reefs, John, Ravenclaw, Draticate. Welcome, guys. Welcome. Thomas, what's going on? They're saying hello, Peter. I'm just reading off the YouTube chat. Hey, how's everybody doing? Yep. So today's chat, I wanted to talk about kind of coral war warfare, placement of coral toxins, how corals kind of fight and try and t beat each other out in a tank. So if you're if you're on a reef, the, that reef space is kind of like prime real estate. A lot of corals, you know, everyone wants those prime spots and corals are going to fight for it. Like you may not realize that, but there's like a slow motion war going on inside <laughs> your little chunk of ocean. And I, yeah. I, it, it's slow motion. I mean, it's very slow, but corals can sense each other. And if there's certain ones that are too close, they're going to start kind of putting up their defenses and either offending or defending, kind of attacking each other. So it's kind of crazy. What's going on in my opinion, TMG? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. So, you know, I, I, I am a, a lover of many corals. So, you know, my tank, it's a, a mixed reef tank is too, you know, as well. I've learned firsthand over the years, you know, exactly how this goes and what happens. And, and then I've ended up doing, you know, a fair share of research into it. And it's interesting how many different ways, you know, I kind of break down when you talk coral warfare, most people are thinking about toxic corals invading each other, stinging each other, that kind of thing. I kind of break it down one level further because I made the total newbie mistake and the first coral or one of the first corals I got was GSP. Mm -hmm. So I also break down coral warfare into invasive corals like that that grow wildly. And right now I'm struggling with the GSP encroaching <laughs> into one of my zoa gardens and literally encrusting right mm -hmm. up and you know kind of covering the zoas. So I'm in there manually hacking it out. So not only does coral warfare you know, tend to happen with the exuding of toxic chemicals or tentacle stinging. I think it's just as much warfare when you have um, these uh, aggressive nuisance corals, I'll say, that, you know, you make the mistake as a beginner, you put in, and they look super cool, but you don't mm -hmm. isolate them, and then they just start kind of overrunning everything else. And while they're not technically toxic to anything else, they're encroaching and killing things just by overrunning it. Yeah, they'll, they'll literally smother it and cut off its light source. And yeah, it's it's unreal watching it. But not it's, so GSP is a great example because that one's a very fast grower. But um, even another one that a lot of people don't necessarily consider, but uh, anemones do a similar thing. If it yes. wants a certain spot, I mean, it's just going to move there, and it doesn't care what's underneath it, and it's going to plant itself right on top. And I mean, yes, it can sting a bit, but more than anything else, it's blocking that light source. So this is kind of interesting. Yeah, you know, so that's a great example. I, I had an anemone that I put in the 90. It was up high. It decided it wanted to come down low. It parked itself right in the middle of a rock full of uh, zoas, and it's continued to grow and grow there without moving whatsoever. And you can now kind of see where the zoas are starting to slowly die off around or be pushed out because it decided to take up home there. I don't know why. It seems to be happy there, and it just doesn't want to move. But uh, it's been there for months, and it just kind of is doing its thing. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's crazy. It's one of those corals too. It, like it doesn't matter where you put it in the tank, it's gonna move until it finds a spot where it's happy. And if you change something, you could maybe change your lighting, change your flow, something, and it's not happy. It's gonna move around and find a new home. I've had ones that sat in the same spot for like seven, eight months, and eventually one day they decide, nope, I don't like it here. I'm gonna go somewhere else. And there's nothing you can do about it except you know move stuff that's in the way. Otherwise, yeah. or hope it wins. You know the battle against it. Yeah, I know. And I, t I totally love, you know, going on the online on Facebook and the forums and stuff. And people are like, oh, yeah, shoot it with some cold water and put it back. I mean, I, it's it's a useless battle. I don't know why people even attempt to do anything but stress them out by moving them around because the mm -hmm. things are just going to go where they want. No, 100 percent agree with you on that one. Now, one of the other kind of interesting ones that I found with a lot of the corals, 
I found the Australian corals are actually the, the most aggressive ones. Like you can have, you can have like, for instance, like a mushroom, you know, you can get them from out in the States, Indonesia and Australia out of everything is by far always seems to be the most aggressive. I mean, Australia on land, they have like the deadliest coral, not corals, That's... but animals, creatures in the world. I mean, it's a harsh environment, everything else. So, so are the corals they have to put up these harsh environments. So they tend to be one of the more aggressive corals out of different species. That's a fact. Everything in Australia is out to kill you. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> yes, pretty much. But yeah, no, it's, ah, it's yeah, it's just really interesting. But it kind of made me laugh at certain ones from Australia seem to be attack other ones. Now, when people are buying corals, some sites will list if they're, you know, peaceful or they're moderately aggressive or if they're aggressive. And most of the time, you don't really know what does that mean, right? What does it mean it's aggressive? And it, there's a few different ways. So corals... One, it could be how fast it grows, so it could overarch other people. So one of the ways a lot of corals will fight or try and take out their neighbors is they'll try and grow either grow over top of them or over over them and shade them so they get the light and their, their neighbors don't. So that's one way. Another way is actually a coral can either release like a sweeper tentacles. Yep. So chalices, for instance, like I'm amazed at some of my chalices, this tiny little eye or mouth, whatever you want to call it, I've seen like three, four inch tentacles come out of that thing. It's just like sweeping across the tank, blowing in the wind. So it's amazing the kind of stuff that you wouldn't even realize. Like, go take a flashlight and look at your tank at night and see all these crazy tentacles coming out. It's amazing how much they'll try and come to just take out their neighbors. Yeah, you know, so one that I find extremely interesting is the ones that will actually extrude their digestive organs mm. and engulf, you know, corals next to them by literally latching onto them and just kind of ingesting them you know with their guts if you've ever seen that live there's a crazy youtube video that uh, we talked about we do a news section in the podcast so we link to a youtube video and it was a few years old but it was you know um time-lapse photo of these you know coral warfare things that were going on and there was a video of that you know of a coral literally throwing up its guts engulfing the thing next to it dissolving it and bringing it in uh, of all the ways of coral warfare going that that to me is you know, I mean, it's the grossest, but it's the most epic to watch, too, because yeah. it, it's just was insane. It, was it like that orangey red donut discosoma or something like that? Yes. Going yeah, at one? Yeah. yeah, it was literally, you could see the strings of stuff. It literally, like, spewed out its guts and internal stuff, using its stomach acid and, like, a web to literally eat away the tissue with the coral beside it. Absolutely yeah, that's crazy. Someone. Yeah, I watched that one last night, actually. <laughs> so... Other kind of interesting ways, like other corals, like some of them will, they'll slime up. And when they slime up, that's one of the mechanisms, right? Because some of that will even have like little toxic, either barbs or spindles in it, or the slime will irritate the next coral or will make it so it can't stick to it. Like I know there's been instances where like an enemy, for instance, went on top of, uh... actually I was talking to Cruz from Elegance Coral. Actually, he sent me a couple of photos I'll put up in a few. But ones where an enemy was kind of blown around the tank and actually landed on a Montipora. And he said the whole thing just absolutely slimed up to make it so that the foot couldn't really get a hold on it. So it would eventually blow off of it. Like, it's just amazing all these different types of stuff that's going on. Yeah, it is. It's when you, you know, when you think about it, I mean, uh, there's so many different things going on. And you see these amazing tanks that are just mixed reefs and loaded with stuff. And, and a lot of people starting out, you know, and I, I think it's, it's one of the things that, isn't talked about enough in this hobby for for beginners they get excited they're like oh i like this coral i like this coral and then maybe like you said you see it says you know semi-aggressive or whatever but the the amount of you know diversity between different corals and the way that they can protect themselves or claim their own spot of land ends up being really prolific so i think one of the things that happens often when i see these posts that are people are like everything in my tank's dying and i don't know why my parameters are spot on is that you can inherently or in inadvertently be experiencing this and there's really no measurement for it your water will test mm -hmm. fine i mean we don't have tests to show you know things like uh you know uh terpenoids being released by softies into the water column so i i, I think and i mean i have no proof of this but I long theorized that people that are like, oh, I tested everything, my parameter's fine, I don't understand why things are dying, probably aren't running carbon and have some sort of coral warfare going on within their mixed reef. Mm -hmm. Now, an another actually interesting point that has popped to my head as you're talking about that is a lot of different stuff in a tank where people have corals at STN or RTN and they don't necessarily know why. And that could very well be from other corals around it, stinging it or releasing those toxins to it. I know actually one video from Julian a while back from Julian Sprung, 
he had one saying where he basically had some certain zoas he put in a tank and had paleotoxins. It had it in the tank for a while, stuff wasn't looking happy, he took took it out. And he, a ton bunch of corals are STNing and RTNing. And so that was all just from one coral in this tank. So a lot of people, you know, they blame alkalinity a lot of time, but there's a good chance it very well could be, you know, certain corals releasing toxins, something's annoyed and angry in the tank, right? And it's affecting it. Now, another kind of defense, certain corals, if they're growing together, sometimes they'll even have like sacrificial limbs they'll put towards it to try and attack or block another coral, which is really kind of crazy. It's stuff that you don't really notice unless you know what to look for. Yep. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, things like you talk about zoas, so people think a zoa is a zoa, a zoa or a pa you know, paleo or whatever, mm -hmm. and they put them together. But interestingly enough, there are actually strains of zoas, while it's more difficult to identify, you really have to know what's going on. There are zoas that shouldn't be next to each, each other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, euphelias are another one that are, are extremely interesting to me, while um, your hammers and frog spawns can sit next to each other. They mm -hmm. shouldn't be sitting next to torches. Your torches should be separated. So it's really interesting that even within the subset of, you know, these genres that they are, you still have to be careful. You can't just make broad swipes at things like all euphelias go together, all zoas go together. You still have to do your due diligence to, to get it down even a level deeper. Yeah. Uh, as a general guideline, usually if they're the same type of coral, you're generally fine. This isn't hundred percent, but generally like a hammer can touch a hammer or a hammer in a frog spawner. Yeah. Usually. Okay. But yeah, for instance, just torches, like torches will win against most things. Like they're fairly aggressive. Like, there's hydrophores. There's certain corals that are usually pretty mean. Chalices usually win. Like there's a lot of certain corals that are just aggressive enough in their attacks that they'll take out other ones. Now, um, with so soft corals, actually, or surprisingly, they're one of the ones that are more with the toxins and slime coats, a lot of that. So yeah. having a mixed reef, that's why most people say a mixed reef is more challenging. It's not just necessarily keeping the corals happy. It's keeping, taking care of that coral warfare at the same time. Yeah, even among that. So, you know, so the you bring up a good point. So softies and, and um, you know, mushrooms and toadstools and things of that nature. Interestingly enough, they're they're the the biggest offenders of all, because when they do, they they typically protect themselves by releasing toxic chemicals into the water. Mm -hmm. And those chemicals are directly um uh, they will directly affect your SPS corals. So your hard corals will be affected and the skeletons will be destroyed by that. So um, you really are taking it to a whole new level when you try to mix in your, you know, if you're a person that wants to go both LPS, SPS, you know, softies and stuff, um, you really need to, and I learned that, that was one of the lessons I learned the hard way. I tried a couple hardy sticks and they thrived and thrived. And then all of a sudden they died off quickly. I could never figure out why. And, uh, you know, and then I realized that, the proximity of them to some other softies and stuff mm -hmm. that I had was likely the culprit of why I couldn't keep them because, you know, again, my parameters were fine. The lighting was fine. So uh, I, I just avoided running, you know, keeping SPS anymore because of that. And, you know, I'm, I'm predominantly a, a softy guy, you know, by heart anyway. So, yeah, I, I've always been, I don't know. I've always been a hardcore mixed reef advocate. I, I like the challenge. I, I like the movement, but I also love the branching structure. So I've always mm -hmm. kind of dug into the two of them. So it's definitely, I don't, I, yeah, I gotta go for it all. I can't restrict myself. <laughs> I try. That's why, you, that's why you have, you know, you get four or five tanks in your house and then you just do one of everything. There you don't, go. Don't limit, don't limit yourself. There you go. Duradica had a good point in the comment. He goes, I believe my toadstool became an issue with its toxins. After I got rid of it, 90% of the toadstool, uh, got rid of 90% of it. The tank got a lot better. So there you go. V very well could have been releasing stuff and annoying a lot of the rest of the tank. Yeah, totally. Toadstools are known to to be in one of that group that can uh, really release some stuff when they're not happy that you just don't even realize it. They're, mm -hmm. they're so fun and cute and gentle looking that why why would they be so deadly? Right. You never know. <laughs> now, like uh, one thing you were mentioning earlier about just where you place the coral in the proximity. So if you have like one kind of tip potentially is having your acros or your softies downstream of the acros. So those toxins are blowing away from it. Now on the flip side, if you're pulsing your water back and forth, this I'm sure it's a sloshing thing anyways, but you could really play with the flow of your tank to allow you greater range of where you place stuff, right? So if you have your flow pushing one way, it's going to be pushing those tentacles away from, you know, your prized acro rather than it going for it. 
Yeah, you know, and I've I've read some articles where people suggest uh, if you're going to do a mixed reef, place your uh, your softies and and stuff like that uh, nearer to your overflow. So if they are releasing um, you know toxins and stuff, they'll be quick more quickly sucked up by the the overflow brought into the column, and then your skimmer or you know hopefully you're running carbon or something that nature can then absorb it and take it. So there there are tips and tricks that plenty of people have in order to you know make sure that you're thriving at that mixed reef level. But uh, yeah, that's that's something interesting to think about uh, the placement downstream or upstream or where your flow affects things too. Mm -hmm. Now, um, another kind of couple interesting things. I'm just going to throw a couple of pics on screen. Just the different types and stuff that if you actually pay attention looking at your tank, how certain ones can attack each other. Like for instance, like this one in the background, they have a couple different Montiporas. And they're starting to, once they touch, they start, you actually see they start to go upwards. They're creating a wall to try and block each other, which is kind of an interesting way, all the different ones. And then this one, do do do. So this is a Montipora Confucia. And so a lot of corals can actually sense the other corals around them. Now, if you look at the top, um, you got a different encrusting one on the bottom. And, and you can see the coral starting to grow out of the rock. So it's starting to purposely try and shade the coral below it. Now, if you look at the top of it, where you got, um, my mic on the name. Um, so now you can actually see all the little towers coming upwards. So the coral is actually going to try and go upwards, create a wall to block it, and then it'll try and shadowing the one behind it. So yeah, it's, it really is kind of crazy how the different structures of it will grow. Um, there's another one of a Monty where those fingers actually a lot of time too, it also will work as a bit of a defense mechanism. So if another, to try and block a different, like an enemy or something else from going on top of it. So it really is interesting, the different kind of growth patterns. There's like another one just growing on an overflow wall. And same thing, you can see where the NEM and all those stuff is below it. And it senses the corals below it, so it starts branching outwards to try and shade it so it can take over that territory. So it's really, really crazy. Yeah, that was Cruz, from, Cruz and Julian from Elegance Coral. Those are the ones that sent me some of those pictures when I was talking to them earlier about it. So quick shout out and thanks to those guys for sending over some of their, their warfare photos. <laughs> I saw I independently fired up YouTube on my other screen so I could see what you're you're showing yep. for video there. But oddly enough, there's a lag here, so I'm I'm watching you with an offset on this. So, yeah, there's about but, a thirty second delay. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so that that's super cool. It it is a, it's it's really amazing when you kind of really just break it down to corals. I mean, you talk to somebody that's not in this hobby or not an enthusiast about it, and they're like, yeah, you know, they think it's a plant or they think it's this or that, and they have no concept of, I uh, you know, while it's not technically intelligence, mm -hmm. the uh, you know, even if it's just pure nature, you know, making them do something instinctual, it's amazing, you know the survival instincts of these simple organisms that, you know, to help them kind of grow, thrive, compete. The fact that they can even have, you know, some kind of warfare between them with no real consciousness is, is just kind of mind blowing. And that's what makes this, you know, this hobby so amazing is that you can replicate this just amazing ecosphere, like in your home and watch these things happen. Mm -hmm. um, so Ozzy was just asking about if Zoas release toxins. So Zoas can, um, now they can, it's more of a chemical toxin. They could, can release that potentially, or they, or more common, they'll actually grow over something or if something's touching them. Maybe they'll release it, but more when something's touching them or aggravating, them, they'll kind of slant, close up and they'll slime off of it and that will release some of the toxin. Now there's a different type called paleotoxins, which is one you see in the news every once in a while. So I'm getting sick from trying to boil the rock or do something else that, that, that this is a different ball game kind of what we're talking about today. But it is something to definitely be aware of. I mean, most of them aren't toxic to a level that most people will even be affected. But there are some that are that definitely will. And the thing is, no one really, 100%, there's no way to say, yes, this one has and yes, this one doesn't. It's more generally tiered towards the palithoas, which are like the big heads, or the ones that have like, they kind of grow in a, like a very close mat. They don't, not necessarily the little flowery button looking ones. So... There are some out there that definitely can. In general, they're not too bad, but they but they are out there. Like certain ones are, and it's kind of Russian roulette. I've never had an issue. Most people haven't, but there is the odd case for it has happened. Yeah, the the name Green Death Pally is not yeah. just a, a cute name that has. I got that some. Those a... are great. 
<laughs> an, an ounce of uh, truth behind it. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's interesting talking to, you know, a lot of the guys that own coral shops mm-hmm. and stuff. And, you know, independently, each one of them said they've experienced some level of, of you know, paletoxin poisoning. Mm-hmm. But when you're fragging that many zoas, you're just bound to kind of come across it. Um, but it's the it's a real deal. It's, you know, these mm-hmm. stories, I, I tend to think some of them in the news get a little exaggerated by the media, but mm-hmm. it's it's a real deal. It's, it's a real thing. It's not something to discount, but again, it's not something to be like, oh my God, don't have these in my tank. Yeah, they're, you get some of the most amazing colors out of zoanthids and different stuff, and I absolutely love them. Oh. I'd never not have them. But, I mean, if your can's cut, like, you know, wear gloves and stuff like that, right? Like, a lot of it's common sense, and a lot of the stories where I've heard of people having issues is because they're, like, boiling it on the stove for some reason. I don't know why you'd boil your rock. <laughs> Or they're like scraping with a brush or something. It's certain things that would cause these toxins to become airborne, and then you breathe it in. And I think in Julian's, on his, he said it actually absorbs through his skin, like no pollutants. So who knows? I mean, that is definitely a possibility. But it's kind of crazy to think about that. So, But honestly, a lot of this, I just say common sense. You know, if you got a big cut, don't stick your hand in the tank. And, you know, don't don't be scratching stuff in your face. Or if you're going to frag and stuff's going to squirt, you know, throw on some safety glasses or something like that. Don't boil stuff. Never boil anything. I don't understand that one. But it's a lot of a lot of things. It's common sense. We'll go along. Yeah, way. yeah. That's you know, you might look foolish, but uh, you know, mm-hmm. ounce prevention goes a long way. So I, I do. I have the actual face shield that I put yeah. down when you know when I'm. So it's 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 no joke. Stuff sprays you in the face all the time. It's mm-hmm. uh, those guys have a lot of water in it, and you know, why take the chance? So yeah, you can look foolish in your own basement or wherever you're fragging. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It doesn't really matter. Um. Now, one thing with corals, the placement of corals is a big thing. So when people buy frags, you don't necessarily know what the coral is going to look like a couple of years from now down the road, right? You buy a little frag because you like the colors of it, Real- realistically, or it looks cool. You put it in your tank, you kind of guess on the positioning, and you don't really know. But, it, I mean, if you know the scientific or the proper names for stuff, it's always worth kind of Googling, looking up to know kind of the growth patterns because it'll give you no idea. Like, corals can... A lot of them will can either branch or they plate, or some can do both. They'll encrust, and depending on a couple factors, one could be the light. Like if you know a certain light highlight with Montipora can make it branch out, where another one can make it more spiral, go upwards. Now another one that people don't consider is that the corals beside it, their neighbors, can also affect how the coral grows. So if you have a coral that's you know you have a Monty or an encrusting one growing up the side of a rock, and the other coral senses it, it's actually going to like push out to the side and try and shade it. Or if you have like a Monty or a different one and an Acro is trying to grow beside it, you'll start to see it grow upwards more to try and create a wall and prevent that coral from overshading it. So it's really crazy. So it's a whole whole new level, but you can literally shape a coral by what's around it to an extent. Yeah, Vicky, why would someone boil live rock? I don't know. Maybe they're trying to kill it or something. If you want to kill a rock, put it in a tub with like, I think it's a 1 to 10 ratio of bleach in it. Completely kill it. That's one way to do it. I don't know why you never boil it. Don't put it on a stove. Don't use your kitchen stuff for briefing. It's bad. Your wife will probably kill you anyways. It's not worth it. Live rock soup. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, like Easy Reef and saying, research, research, research. Definitely goes a long way. Uh, flow patterns except growth and pollock exemptions. Definitely does. One of my buddies, I know, he had his plinsa slumber to mine. He had all his flow, kind of like I did, but he had it more just blasting. All his corals were all lean to one side, growing. And you can totally tell where the flow was. It was great. <laughs> Uh, trying to catch up on the comments. Uh, yeah, Mel's. I don't know if it's Mel's Mila's Reef. I actually met him last week. Um, he did a stream on paleotoxins last Saturday. Actually, I watched it the other yeah, day. It was, it was yeah, good. Mark. Yeah. 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 He's a nice guy. Uh, yeah, on that is. note, I I met Mark in Vegas last week. Mm-hmm. So last week, sneak peek preview. I was actually in Vegas checking out for where Macna twenty eighteen is going to be. So let's check out the hotel and where all the stuff is. So. There'll be a video on that one coming out soon. I just got to get to editing it, but it's going to be a good one. That's super exciting. When, yeah. When's Magna this year? September? S- September 7th and 9th, I believe. Nice. And it's going nice. to West, be awesome. Westgate Hotel in Vegas. And now Vegas, at least for me, in Canada, I don't know about the rest of the world, but Vegas is cheap to get to compared to anywhere else. So to me, for, for me, I'm like, hey, it's super cheap to go to the show. I'm going. So definitely I'm going to go. So if you guys are coming, better come say hi. 
Yeah, even on the East Coast of the U.S., everybody always has a deal to Vegas. So and a lot of times, if without a lot of effort, you can find a flight and a hotel together for, you know, just a few hundred dollars round trip. So it's 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 worth the trip to to make it out there and and yeah. go check it out. I mean, that's, you know, the pre premier event, uh, you know, in the U.S. for for our hobby. So and it's this is the 30th anniversary, so it's going to be big. It's going to be big. I literally went, went walked around and checked all the areas that all the events are going to be and filmed some little clips of it. So I'm excited to actually put this together and edit it to a video. It's good. It'll be exciting. So yeah, definitely. I want less people to go because I'm going and it's going to be fun. Uh, Mark mentioned you on the live stream. Yes, I hung out with Mark last week. I met him last week. It was good. Have a drink with me. I will, Nick. Let's do it. <laughs> um, had a stunner and a cap... <laughs> shaping each other to avoid touching that is kind of funny too so corals will they'll try and grow around each other too to kind of take off that space so you could have one like spiraling around each other certain ones will do that and others will like you'll see a uh, acropora branching over a monty and the monty will be growing along the edge of it so they're each trying to claim their little chunk of territory hey cruise yeah, yeah. Yep. so oh sorry go ahead oh no sorry saw cruise jumped on welcome so Cruz, if you haven't met him, he runs Elegance Core, or at least partially runes it. And yeah, super knowledgeable guy. I've already showed off some of his wonderful photos. So if you want to come hang out and chat, Cruz, feel free. I'm already in, actually. Welcome back. I snuck in. <laughs> <laughs> I snuck in. Excellent. Have you caught much of the live stream so far? Um, no, just a little bit of it. Um, you guys were talking, I didn't want to interrupt, so I was being very, very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so yeah, what else do you have for some other good tips? Actually, one actually we should get into. So you have a mixed reef tank, you know, these certain chemicals and toxins are in your water. What's the best way to deal with it? So the easiest way for most people is to run activated carbon, you know, have your activated carbon change every mm -hmm. few weeks. Cause that carbon is going to absorb a lot of those toxins and stuff in the water and prevent a ton of issues. Uh, one of the other yep. things that I do, I also run ozone, which will break down those toxins. Mm -hmm. So I run a small amount of that through my skimmer. So those are the two biggest ones. I mean, other than like proper husbandry and where you place stuff, but that's kind of ways you can deal with it once you know that there is a little bit of warfare going in your tank. Yep. And uh, what we do is uh, we utilize the bacterial method where we also aerate uh, along with the uh, with the bacteria, let the bacteria break down some of those toxins as well naturally. So detoxifies it. Yep. So Cruz, I know you're you're a big fan of the microbubbling, obviously, since you're no, the one that's no, started proposing not at it. All. <laughs> <laughs> so that's this is another thing that I do in my tank as well. Apparently, I do a lot of stuff to prevent warfare. Mm. I just realized. Um, so with that. <laughs> so the micro bubbling at night will help. So I know I've explained this a few times, but it's for anyone that doesn't quite know, it essentially is like a protein skimmer, right? You have these little bubbles. It's called like refraction foams, probably the more technical name, but proteins and certain things will attach to those bubbles and it gets into your skimmer, it pops in the cup. And that's how you're moving the stuff from your water. Now, if the micro bubbles in the tank, same thing, it's going to attack these proteins. If corals are sliming up because they're fighting other stuff, it's going to help attach bits of that, bring it to the top and bring it out of your tank through overflow, through your filtration. So it's certain, all the stuff are little steps that are working at reducing the impact of this coral warfare that's inevitably happening or going to happen in your tank as stuff grows up. Correct. Correct. That flotation separation really, really works, mm -hmm. especially with the, uh, with the slime. Uh, that a lot of the softies put out um, or, you know, uh, gosh, what was that? Like some of the anemones where they would actually, um, oh gosh, what is it called? Where they actually just release a lot of the toxins or digested uh, foods. Um, so a lot of the waste products and it would just dump a lot of that onto the neighboring corals to give itself room to actually grow. Mm -hmm. So yeah, utilizing its own, uh, Stomach waste acid. and fecal matter to actually <laughs> <laughs> to actually uh, defeat you know a neighbor i mean i swear my neighbor's like that too sometimes i swear they don't i well, swear they don't the the window. for a reason nice, <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh that's, yeah lovely uh all thumbs down was saying sponges remove toxins I, do they actually i'm not sure about that one to be honest i know they're good at they cleaning like, and filtering they, yeah they do filter out some of it and being that a lot of the sponges are silicate based, they don't react. Um, uh, how do you say it? The uh, the nematocysts or a lot of the slimes um, that the corals, you know, do during normal warfare doesn't affect them as much. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? 
because a lot of the silicates block out a lot of that, uh, you know, the effects of the nematocysts and also the slime production and mm -hmm. also the toxicity. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty pretty interesting. I know that when when we had an all-out warfare uh, between the Manis and the Acros and some of the uh, some of the other ACANs in the system, yeah, the sponges were unaffected. Um, you know, mm -hmm. we saw STN on some of the corals, you know, near the bases where the sweepers hit. We saw some RTN, you know, um, you know, where a lot of the slime kind of and, and mucus kind of like landed on an Acropora or a Monopora and just kind of suffocated that spot. Mm -hmm. huh. And uh, so that's why <laughs> Elegant Corals uh, likes to keep species only and or, um, you know, um, you know, Acropora only tanks, Monopora tanks, LPS tanks, Softy tanks, and try to separate it out so that we have minimal um uh, I want to call fatalities or, or um, you know, losses mm -hmm. for that matter. And we don't even connect it to the same sump. They're on their own separate sump systems. Fully separated. Just in case. Yeah. So Absolutely. Ozzy was asking, how do we grow acros close together? Like this. <laughs> <laughs> Just place them next to each other and they'll yep. fight. <laughs> The strongest, the strongest, <laughs> the strongest coral win. <laughs> Two acros enter, one leaves. Yeah. So absolutely, it's like blood sport of corals, right? Yeah. Slow mo, slow mo, <laughs> slow motion blood sport. <laughs> so interestingly, I found some some with the branches. Like I mean, every every species is obviously a bit different, but I've had some where they'll start to grow together. They'll fight. The tips usually turn white, and then they'll start overgrowing again and almost fuse together. I don't know if they decide to play nice mm -hmm. or what, what, what happens there, but it's interesting to kind of see that progression of it. Oh, absolutely. Like when you see uh, two Monoporas kind of clash and uh, join up, um, do you have that picture, Dev, uh, that I sent to you earlier? Uh, the two Montes? Yeah, the two Montes, where they yep. actually uh, formed a, a almost like a mountain range up against each other as mm -hmm. they merged together. And it was, it was kind of... Uh, it's what we call a ridge formation between two money plates that are of different species. Mm -hmm. And they actually just butt up against each other and then start shooting up to see who could actually race over the other one fastest. That's the way I like to think about it. Mm -hmm. eh. Whether or not that's true or whether or not money ports think I'm not, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to give it uh, too much credit, but mm -hmm. no, they, uh, they are, you know, constantly trying to throw up different structures. That's one of the things that we observed and, uh, you know, whether or not it's just because they're running into each other and the only way is up or mm. whether or not they're actually throwing stuff at each other. Not really 100 percent sure about that. Or, uh, you know, it, it's a lot of speculation on our part. And we like to, you know, relate human activities and human structures to why we would actually build certain things. Kind of like the Acropora and the Monopora. Um, I think Dev showed earlier. Um, where they would actually, um, you know, the Acropora would try to race over and grow over the Monopora, mm -hmm. and the Monopora would actually throw up a wall, Yeah, basically, and that's what we call knuckling. Yeah. I just um, want to throw a quick shout out, Prolific Breed, $5 Super Chat, thank you very much, much, appreciate, much appreciated. You need sure now to host a live stream, great info being shared, Woo! and the channel is very welcoming, keep up the good work. Thank you so much, man, much appreciated. Awesome. Yep. So, yeah, I mean, it's uh, Where's really, really interesting just watching, you know, day to day and taking pictures, you know, every two to three days and seeing how these, you know, how these corals mm -hmm. grow together, how they're reacting towards each other in proximity, mm -hmm. you know, little things like that. Yeah. And, it's, you know, I, I enjoy watching it. I call it war in slow motion. Um, it is, literally. <laughs> Dev and I were talking about that earlier. And mm -hmm. it, it, it's kind of like, um, you know, just watching like two snails fight do you know what i'm saying <laughs> <laughs> yep um i just stripped that you're talking about the knuckling i just kind of threw that up in the background where you can see the, like the monty how it's all flat and you got these white back and forth ridges and there's no polyps mm -hmm. on it it's just kind of like the bone skeletal structure so it literally is building its kind of rock barricade to help stop the other coral from coming over to its territory mm -hmm. absolutely yep. Yeah, it's interesting. I see a lot of guys now are, are starting to, you know, fuse and, you know, favias and stuff, and, you know, which are, you know, same strain, so they're not battling. But it's uh, mm -hmm. interesting to see, you know, how 
things even that are opposing corals can you know kind of come together, start fusing, and then even so, Cruz, have you experienced in in you know doing corals and stuff like that? Have you ever experienced anything ending up becoming symbiotic together uh, as opposed to battling uh, out? Seen, or? Yeah, we've seen some uh, some interesting stuff. Um, a, a lot of it is monies. We have seen some Acropora take on some characteristics of a neighboring Acropora. Um, we're seeing a lot of uh, zooxanthella exchange in a lot of enclosed systems, and that's where we're getting a lot of these morphs, you know, coming into the uh, into the hobby, where you get the green streaks, what we call green, pro you know, the green protein or the green fluorescent protein uh, infection, mm -hmm. basically, and uh, you would start getting this nice green streak that's uh, fluorescent in a coral that typically wouldn't have it. Uh, for instance, the Moniporas, when you see the green streaks, it's what we call the uh, the bicolor or uh, what is that fancy name that they sell it under? Uh, Worldwide Corals did it first. The grafted um, ones or different ones? Yeah, it was the, the Monipora, the green and orange one. Uh, yeah, I can't remember half the names, but yeah. But yeah, that one's uh, one of the classics now and very, very pretty, especially if the striations, you know, the bonnie pour is growing re really, really fast. You get a lot of uh, what we would call tiger striping uh, in those money plates. And it's beautiful. Um, you get the fluorescent orange and you get the friggin' uh, fluorescent greens in it, too. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, it's uh, very, very beautiful when uh, when it first came out and then people started trying to to fuse uh, the orange with the purples and the orange with the green, you know, and the purple with the greens, but it just turns out brown. <laughs> Looks really kind of poo, you know what I'm saying? So there's some that join up and make a very, very stunning coral, and then there's others that just not really too uh, eye-catching. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah. the promotion of natural selection in your own <laughs> ecosphere. Exactly. Adapt or die. Everything eventually turns brown, right? I was kidding. <laughs> yeah. And the, and the ocean must look brown. Honest, okay, on that note, the lighting in our tanks is like 90% of the color. If you see, like, when the sun hits my tank, like, I love the look of that warm glow throughout the tank with the blues on, but you just see when it's straight sun, like, they all look brown. And we see the other side where the blues hitting is, like, vibrant and colorful. Like, it's crazy just the colors it reflects. Just to quickly... But, um, you know, uh, yeah. what, what Elegant Corals pride themselves in is mm -hmm. that we're actually running some 67s and also 10Ks and some 12.5s uh, as well, halides. And uh, we get full coloration. We hate, um, you know, we, we rarely take blue photos unless a coral, you know, that we acquire from another, uh, you know, another reputable vendor, mm -hmm. you know, takes the pictures underneath that blue light. Then we'll try to replicate it. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Other than that, we like utilizing the regular 12K, 14K, 10K, and six, you know, 6700K mm -hmm. halides. And it seems, you know, the 10K and 12.5 is the happy medium between growth and coloration. Oh, I actually use around the 12K-ish for a lot of time when I'm doing videos because it shows up well on camera. Just a little pro tip. Oh, absolutely. It takes beautiful pictures, mm -hmm. especially the, uh, the photoprotective uh, pigmentation generation of the corals. Mm -hmm. the reflectivity um that actually pops um mm -hmm. and it also um you know underneath the actinix and then you know it develops underneath the warmer the warmer kelvin uh type of bulbs mm -hmm. that's one of the things that we did observe um you know once again what the mechanisms are i don't know <laughs> <laughs> okay. but it works but, you know yeah but it works you works know and a lot of the, the hobby was trial and error for a long time. And then all of a sudden, for some reason, you know, people started getting into it and then people wanted to know answers. And a lot of the times I could say, I don't know, you know, I'm probably one of the few people that would actually admit that I don't know something because I don't, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, Dev, yep. it, every day is like something new, you know, that I'm like noticing in the, in the tanks, in the tank systems with Julian. And, uh, you know, we're constantly like looking, observing, seeing how certain, you know, additives and supplements actually affect the coral coloration. You know, does it affect the growth pattern? Does it affect the, you know, the skeletal structure, making it stronger, more brittle, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it, it's still, you know, when people say, well, this is all that a coral needs, I highly doubt that if we don't have nature working with us. That, Does that make sense? That goes yeah. back to the 
live stream for a week or two about kind of surviving versus thriving. Like, yes, maybe that's all it needs to be alive and not die, but it's not necessarily thriving and growing in, in its prime. Correct. You know, it's an amazing too, like how far science is. I mean, I was just down in Curacao for a, uh, a vacation and I, I got a tour of the aquarium down there and they're doing um, experiments with zoas that they're doing grow outs with to kind of identify, but they're doing DNA experiments with it. So, you know, how inexpensive technology is getting in the science world to allow things like DNA mapping of corals and then, you know, testing with things like aminos and everything else. It's it's amazing you know, how these other industries getting the price down on stuff is really changing, you know, this hobby industry into a, a very, very like, you know, important part of, you know, saving the planet to, you know, kind of help figure out these corals. So it's just really wild to see we're really kind of in this hobby at an amazing time. Absolutely. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. And you hit the nail on the head on that one. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, sometimes though, science can't explain everything. You know what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. sometimes do we have time to let science explain everything before we could actually save the world, you know, or save our coral reefs for that matter. Yeah. You know, if something's working in multiple systems across the world with different types of systems, you know, for instance, the bubbling, the ozone, so on and so forth, you know, do we have to explain all the mechanics for it before we could even implement it? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, if it works, you know, in, in various systems, you know, repeatedly, you know, for the last, I want to say, 20 plus years, <laughs> do we have to explain it or does it become a fact? Anecdotal you know, evidence anecdotes? to the extreme. <laughs> exactly. Yep. How many anecdotal evidences equals a fact mm -hmm. or at least an observable fact? 13. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> 42 yeah. is the answer. <laughs> Just want to quickly hit this question that scrolled by a minute ago. Uh, Rossi's Reef Tank, how do we get rid of sponges that are overgrowing your corals? Sponges are really easy to remove. Like, literally just rip it off with your hand. That's all I've ever done. It's yeah. been overgrowing. Yeah. Zones we also zones. utilize, uh, we, we also utilize, uh, kid you not, credit cards to actually yeah. scrape off a little yeah. bit more. Um, they will grow back if there's any cells left on the rocks or nooks and crannies of the rocks. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, you can knock it back pretty pretty easily no the They're best tool hard. i have i don't know if you guys have these out but if you go to like a convenience store that sells the scratch off lottery tickets mm -hmm. they give yes. away these little tiny mm -hmm. plastic things that like kind of look like a flat shovel with an edge to scratch off the scratch tickets those hands <laughs> down have been the best tool for like getting my anemone feet off out of baskets and things like that so if, if you live anywhere that has scratch tickets see if they have those and grab a handful of them Any because that has been yeah a totally invaluable <laughs> yeah. tool in, in all my yeah. frag tags God dang it. I was saying credit cards so that, you you just <laughs> so that they would have it ready in credit. hand just in case they want to buy corals. <laughs> uh, Scratch my tip. Yeah. Credit cards. That's the way to go. <laughs> nice. Um, SC Reefer is asking, what corals get along with hammers and frog spawn? So those two will actually generally get along with each other. Um, they can be quite aggressive to other corals and either other LPSs. Um, Octo spawns probably fine with them. But if, like hammer curls, for instance, like I know mine gets some pretty long sweepers that'll come out yeah. and it'll do some damage to anything around it. I had a rainbow Monty right beside it and the whole side where that big sweeper came out was just all white from it taking it out. So they can definitely be fairly aggressive. Yeah, do not underestimate the amount of length those tentacles can come out of those things. So if you buy it at the store and it's a nice little tight ball and it looks all pretty, do not underestimate the fact that they can get two, three inches out as soon as it gets settled in and get happy. And so, you know, when anytime you're doing your hammers, your frogs born, your torches, you really have to use due diligence to think of the spacing around them because those things can really let loose once they're happy. Um, yeah, torches, that's another one that's kind of the same LPS kind of zone. Those ones you definitely want to be on their own. Torches can touch other torches, but torches will generally sting almost everything else. Like, I sometimes use torches to tame the mushrooms on this one rock so they won't grow out. But, uh, yeah, they will win against most things. Chalices is another one that will usually win, is the chalice. Now, chalices, actually, amazingly, I've seen some giant sweepers. I got a big Miami vice miami whatever it is miami vice miami something hurricane on top of the rock and that thing has you know it's like a decent size and you wouldn't think about it you got these little tiny eyes that are like the size of like the end of a pen and you'll get like four inch sweepers coming out of those little tiny circles like it's amazing how long the sweepers on these things actually oh, are yeah. 
Yeah, they're crazy. I have one of those. Have you ever seen those magnifying, like kind of um, algae scrubber yep. things you can put on your tank? So I have one of those, and I go down, and I have I have a cap that's probably you know yay big and stuff, uh, kind of growing off of a rock, kind of plating out. And uh, I'll go down at night right before things really go down, and I'll bring that out. And man, it's just unreal the tentacles that come out of that thing. That when you get the feeding response out of a mani, I hands down think that's one of the most epic things to see in your tank because you just half the time don't even realize they're there and for a lot of newbies they don't even realize that that happens they just think you know the eyes are there and never even notice the tentacles but if you can see that if you've never seen it go look in your tank it's it's yeah. just wild to see those take a flashlight to your tank at night if you've never done it it really can be amazing the stuff you'll find yep. um oh, yeah. who is it dr wells magic uh my galaxy of coral has 10 inch sweepers like that is huge yeah oh god like it's amazing. Now, earlier we were kind of talking to you about how you can control it to an extent with the flow. So just pay attention to where your flow is. And if you can push, because the sweepers aren't going to go up flow. They're only going to go down flow, right? They can yep. move around to an extent and swing around in the flow. But if you can push them away from, you know, your acros and other stuff that they're potentially going to sting, that's one way you can kind of get away with putting stuff a bit closer in your tank. Um, yeah, you know, one, one coral that we haven't mentioned that, uh, and I don't know why I got one. I, I didn't do due diligence on this a while ago, but an elegance coral. I was very surprised how aggressive and, uh, you know, toxic they can be with their tentacle stings. I had them really screw up a bunch of rock flower anemones and had to end up moving it. So that's that's one that looks gorgeous. And, and um, I, I self-admittedly didn't do due diligence when I got my very first one. But that's another one to look out for because they get huge quick. Yes. And I mean, they can really open up and fan out. So... You know, those guys definitely get pretty big. Um, another one that you can kind of... Because a lot of people usually ask and certain corals go together. So generally the same species for the most part. Not not the same like SPS, LPS. Like that's too broad. But the same species like hammers or for, like mm -hmm. acans or micro, micromisa, microfuchsia. However you say it, micromisa. Like those can generally go together and they'll be fine. Now there's also like acan lords. Like sometimes some of those don't necessarily play nice. But, you know, generally like an acan or micromisa is... Generally, they can touch and be fine together. Like, I have mine all clumped together, and, and everyone plays nice. So, <laughs> no, no, kids play nice. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make me put my hand in that tank. Yep. <laughs> but, yeah, when, you, when you're adding a new coral, like, consider if it's aggressive and the proximity around it. You know, you want to have a few inches of space or more on some of these corals with giant sweepers. Yeah, I mean, an ounce of planning goes a long way. And, and with anything in this hobby, patience is king. So take the extra five minutes to pull out your phone. I mean, you have internet in your pocket, almost everybody. You know, if you're at the shop and you see a coral that just wows you, pull out your phone. Unless you are very close with that shop and you have full trust in them, if you're somewhere that you don't know, don't necessarily trust them because I, I hate to say it, but there are people in this hobby that will, you know, tell you what you want to hear to sell a coral. Mm -hmm. um, but take the five minutes, pull out your phone, see what people say, see what, you know, valued resources yeah. like, you know, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to pick any particular one, but see what people are saying about these things and where to place them and what they go with, what they don't. Taking 10 minutes can save you hours of headaches. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay. Cruz, that's a huge shout out. Cruz, $75 super chat. That's my biggest one ever. Thank you so much. That is amazing, I, I like man. to think it's because I'm on the show. It, it, it must be. Thank you. <laughs> Cruz, thank you so much, brother. Definitely appreciated. Cruz is a fountain of knowledge, so I'm always happy when he joins. So he's always got tons of great information for the hobby. And thank you so much for that super duper record breaking super chat. In the chat, someone else saying War Coral has surprise long tentacles. That has that name for a reason. <laughs> yes, yes, yep. it does. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, you know, when I, I'll throw one more tip here while you're looking through the, the map. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is something I don't do because I'm lazy. But another thing, you know, we talked about carbon and protein skimmers and stuff too, is you can't discount the fact of, of water changes now. I'm a, a Triton method guy, so I don't like to do water changes. But, you know, if, if you feel like something's going awry because you think you may have some sort of water, you know, warfare going on, mm -hmm. you know, don't don't discount uh, the value of, you know, doing some water changes, partial water changes or rapid water changes for a small amounts or something though mm -hmm. you know I, I it's a no-brainer for a lot of people i don't know specifically who your audience is that typically watches these but I, I like to try to cover all my bases with you know assuming that we have people from all walks of the hobby here mm -hmm. um someone was just quickly asking about leptoceris leptoceris is kind of one of those semi-aggressive ones but something falls on it it will probably kill it mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Yep. So out, out of curiosity, what's the meanest kind of coral that you've had in your tankers? Um, there was one that we called the Darwin. It was a green Aussie uh, type of Acropora. Very, Aussie, very Aussie. mean. Um, um, out of the Acroporas, it's probably the meanest. Um, out of all the corals, I would say the, the hammers, of course, um, mm. the torches. They've got really, really, really long stinger tentacles, sweeper tentacles um, mm. that could actually, you know, decimate an Acropora tank. Um, so we, tr I mean, even, even after, you know, clipping, clipping some of the sweepers, you know, with the surgical scissors, if it actually touches any of the acros, they get stung so badly that they STN or RTN in that spot Wow! and probably the surrounding tissue. Does it actually wow. work but cutting their sweepers? I've, I've done it a number of times and it, it, they, they tend to not put it out as far. Fair enough. <laughs> So I don't know whether or not it's uh, it, it's wishful thinking that I'm not seeing it, or or mm -hmm. if just uh, placing it in another tank or further away down in the sand bed, yeah. that that's uh, you know that that actually helps a little bit as well. But mm -hmm. you know, once again, a lot of it's uh, you know wishful thinking. Sometimes we're hoping that yep. certain things that we're doing affects it in a positive way, um, and you know, I don't know. I've, I've cut them before and they don't seem to send out sweepers as far or as long. <laughs> That's fair. So they've learned their lesson. <laughs> lesson learned. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's like bad boy. Johnson, bad boy. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> Johnson, the chat was saying that the pectina sweepers are crazy. So those are kind of like um, Space Invader, I think it's the common name. Most of those they are like the big funky looking ones. And I haven't had one of those personally, but yeah, he's saying they have some crazy long sweepers. And uh, definitely the chalices are mean as mm -hmm. well and a lot of the um you know that's like some of the bower bankies as well from uh, from us mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of the a cans too yep yeah actually i haven't found a cans be aggressive but i guess i can have them separated but yeah chalices are definitely one of the ones they're nasty and everything chalices usually usually win and then a hammer will usually win too just remember those two <laughs> <laughs> ozzy says just keep back rows that's what we do in our systems. Uh, we tend to separate the more aggressive ones towards the upper portion mm -hmm. of the tank, um, especially utilizing the bubbling so that a lot of the slime or the, uh, you know, or some of the uh, nematocysts mm -hmm. that they shoot out float up and out over to the overflow. The overflow. Um, away, yeah, exactly. Away from the other, um, so the my other acro. My tank's the opposite. It's like as far as can possibly be from the overflow. <laughs> Good planning. <laughs> yeah, so like we have the more overflow. aggressive yeah, we have more of the aggressive ones closer to the overflows mm -hmm. so that it could be, uh, you know, so that a lot of that uh, that slime or mucus or whatever mm -hmm. gets sucked out a, uh, a lot faster than, um, you know, if they're further away from the uh, from the overflows. Oh, that makes sense. So, How about for you, Peter? Yeah. What's been your most aggressive curls you've had to deal with in the hobby? Yeah, I'll say uh, the elegance that I had because that was my own fault. But that thing just, you know, I got it. I thought it was only a couple inches big. It settled in and it ended up being about six, seven, eight inches big with two, three inch tentacles. So that wreaked havoc on my rock flowers. Uh, and then most recently, I, I have about a 15 head uh, uh, hammer that uh, I got. Beautiful, beautiful hammer. And I really underestimated its reach on that. So I put it in and uh, it ended up, you know, sweeping out four or five inches from uh, you yeah, know, the furthest head and, and ended up uh, making uh, angry A cans all over. I have an A can rock kind of there. So it, it ended up getting a lot further than I gave it credit for. So that, that's that been the, the most damage that I'd done. I, you know, I had to really kind of scramble and move mm -hmm. things, yeah. things out. But so, yeah, that elegance actually killed one of my rock flower nems. I, I mean, a lot of them came back, and but one of them, uh, yeah, just it, it never recovered. So that, that one was probably the most deadly of, of all the ones that I've had mm -hmm. to deal with nice um there was a quick question a second ago about keeping a cans together so there's a cans or micromusa and there's a can lords i don't necessarily know if the lords always play nice with the micromusa or the general the standard a cans they're renamed the name is micromusa i still call them a cans but um generally the if you have different types of a cans or micromusas they're generally fine to touch sometimes the lords don't always play nice with the normal ones though so overall yes but sometimes you got to watch out if they're the different genus of them 
and, and you got to pay attention to because I mean I love I'm an ACAN junkie mm-hmm. and they're constantly renaming what is what or what it, you know so and that's mm-hmm. right you know that that's nail on the head there is that the ACAN lords typically don't want to go with a regular ACAN so be cautious if you see something just labeled as ACAN at your store make sure you do your own research to understand <laughs> what it actually is absolutely absolutely do your homework Dang it. Yes. Do your homework. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, the, the general rule, if they're the same subspecies, they're fine. If they're different subspecies, then do a little more research into it. That, that's what I've kind of went with, and so far, so good. <laughs> yeah, so far, we've uh, we found a lot of the uh, Indonesian and the Vietnamese uh, acros mm-hmm. to be a little bit uh, more docile than, the, uh, the, uh, than their brethren over there in Australia. Mm-hmm. So we try to separate those into their own separate systems as well. Um, hey, Cruz, do you, just so maybe people will find this interesting, but do you yeah, but, theorize at all because of other things in the water in those areas that cause these to be? I mean, do you have any kind of guess why that is? Because we talked about that early on in the, the show, absolutely. you know, absolutely. that Australia I mean, seems deadly. <laughs> but I think they're just mean spirited. They hate <laughs> each other. <laughs> <laughs> They're just a holes of the okay, freaking <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, no, I, I seriously think that uh, that the warm water, the competition for food, the competition for real estate, okay. definitely has to play a lot with it. Um, it's survival of the fittest. Whoever's the meanest and the baddest over there in those freaking waters typically survive. Yeah. Um, you know the overcrowding on the freaking Great Barrier Reef. I mean, take a look at the density of the mm-hmm. corals that were on there. Mm-hmm. So they would either a grow faster. They would either a grow faster or b you know try to you know try to kill the other one um or kill the other corals that are uh, surrounding it you know with uh you know poisonous stingers or you know some other um other mechanical means and or chemical warfare you know it's not just uh, it's not just a one or the other sometimes it's a combination of both especially the cone snails too I mean, we yeah. see it in those invertebrates. Why wouldn't it transfer over to the invertebrates called corals? You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Or jellyfish, for that matter. No, very true. Uh, so Terrence was saying the Echinastas send out ground-based tentacles. I did not know that. Ooh, yeah, the Echinatas. The Echinatas are... F- they're sneaky bastards. <laughs> <laughs> they're sneaky tackle on the sand bed. <laughs> yeah. It depends on your flow, too. Mm-hmm. Um and uh, yeah, but yeah, typically on the echinadas, they do send out lower mm-hmm. uh, type of uh, stinging sweepers than you know the longer polyps as you know what people see as polyps. Mm-hmm. But yeah, they're specialized polyps that uh, that have these stinging cells, very very similar to jellyfish uh, you know tentacles that have these stinging cells all over it. Mm-hmm. You know, just like uh, a lot of the hammers and uh, and the torches as well. Yeah, and so- uh, if you actually take a look at it and you you know really take a look at the polyps that's typically the 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 juvenile form of what a jellyfish looks like you know it looks like just any other coral Mm -hmm. you know on the sedentary state but once it actually goes uh you know uh uh, what is it called once it goes uh free free floating free swimming um at that point then all of a sudden those tentacles become extremely long elongated it's also specialized in the grasping and hunting tools Mm-hmm. But yeah, when they're babies, they just look like uh, fuzzy polyps. Yeah, or fuzzy pink polyps. <laughs> That's crazy how much it worse. Uh, scroll, I miss anything? Yeah, I think uh, uh, Dev uh, Terrence was looking for a link. If uh, if you could shoot it off to him. Let me quickly grab one. All right. Yeah, I'll drop that in the chat if anyone wants to join. See if that works, Terrence. I don't know if that link will work. Absolutely. I know a couple of people. Have yeah, I might have anymore. to drop off, guys, um, in a little bit, so I apologize. Uh, love you all. Um, Terrence, love you, brother. I'll see you soon. I'll see you at MACNA. Um, Dev and everybody else, yep. Nick, too, because I'll see you over there at MACNA as well. You so. sure will. You sure will. I'll definitely be there. And Cruz, thank you so much for the record-breaking Super Chat. Much appreciated. <laughs> Dude, you deserved it, buddy. Uh, you've been doing these, uh, you know, doing these live streams on and off, and it's a lot of work. A lot of people don't uh, realize that, but it's a lot of work. Yep. No, well, de- definitely appreciate it. So thank you. Oh no, I appreciate you too. All right, see you later, man. Okay. See you guys. Sounds good. Have a good day. Everybody else, Nick too. Buzz. I'll see you over there at Mac as well.
Yes, so, sir. All right, time for Hey, see you, Terrence. So much later, later, Narcosis. <laughs> later, buddy. Later, Cruz. Deserve the buddy. Uh, later. Right. See you guys. What, what's going on? Thumbs down, Terrence. A lot of work. A lot of people don't uh, realize Not it. Not a lot, man. Yep. Not a lot. Oh, no. I appreciate you, too. Oh, you got the YouTube play, and you got to make sure you mute that. I'll see you over there in a minute as well. All right, Terrence. There. I mean, I, I just muted you for a sec. Make sure you kill your YouTube window so you don't get the double echo echoing. Yeah, so if anyone else has any specific questions about any certain corals or placement or warfare or any of that stuff in the comments, for sure, let me know. Otherwise, if anyone wants to join the Hangout chat for a bit, feel free to hop in. Links. Hey, is that better? Yep, there we go. Perfect. Back in business. They changed the icons on the top, so I'm trying to figure out what's... Cause it's got the little slash through it, so does that mean it is or it isn't? They should have had the slash or not the slash. I would agree with you on that one. <laughs> yeah, instead, instead, it turns red or not red. Yeah. But very useful for a colorblind guy. <laughs> no kidding, eh? Uh... I'm not colorblind, too, so... <laughs> Are you guys? Are you both actually? I am slightly colorblind. Yes. Okay. I'm actually full colorblind. I just see a bunch of grays. Really? Oh. So with corals, this is totally off topic. But do you purchase them based on more of the structure of them? Because I know when um, I when I buy coral, I, I'm based off color. Like I mean, structure to an extent. But half time, I'm like, ooh, I don't have that color. Like that's half my decision. It's terrible, but it's true, right? So. When I buy corals, um, I guess you could say I kind of like compare it to like the clouds. Mm -hmm. Like when you like look up at the clouds, all you can see is white, gray, and basically like a bunch of white and gray, gray shades, right? Mm -hmm. So like I can actually like look at the coral and tell like, oh, this thing is shining, you know, to me, you know? So that's mm -hmm. how I buy corals. Okay. That's cool. No, it's good to know. I've, I hope this is curious. Nice. I, I actually end up seeing things that other people don't see sometimes in coral that mm -hmm. it's kind of bizarre. So I'll be like, wow, that's really interesting. I'm like, what? That just looks pretty normal to me. Like, oh, okay. Oh, that's that's cool, though. That's actually really interesting. <laughs> it's something um, I've never considered yeah. before. So. Yeah. And then something else that actually helps me is like... Um, I see a lot of corals and mm -hmm. I, I go to like a lot of like fish shops and a lot of people's houses and stuff. Mm -hmm. So like, if I see something like I've never seen before, I'll probably buy it. Yeah. I'll probably just like impulse buy it because if I've never seen that coral before, that means that coral is either one of two things. It's either rare or it's unpopular or somebody <laughs> used to have it, but they don't have it anymore. Yeah. There is, there is a lot of certain corals where it used to be same thing. Like um, like one of my favorite corals, actually, is the Palmer Blue Millie. Like, that's my favorite coral in my tank. And that used to be a popular coral, but now you hardly ever see it out there anymore. And same with, like, some of the Cali torts and certain ones. It used to be very popular. Now, I don't know if they fade away or died off or not as popular. But, yeah, there's tons of corals that are awesome corals that you just don't see as much as you used to. Um, So something that I actually noticed about, like, corals is it kind of goes by, like, territory i guess mm -hmm. like everybody around here has all those corals but there are only like 10 bucks so nobody's buying them if we ship them to you they'd be worth like a lot over there because you don't have them over there anymore you know stuff mm -hmm. like that yeah it's like uh, black widow and enemies so that you know they're very popular in our regional area here so i'm able to get them locally yeah maybe get 100 bucks for them go on you know, the Facebook groups or sell them or want to ship them out. People are paying three bills, you know, for them all day. So it, it's, it's just really interesting, you know, how something could be popular in a regional area, but if you will, on something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I can get like green slimers for like 10 bucks. I can get um, red planet for like 10 bucks. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about like two inch pieces, you know, there's, which one? Uh, someone was just asking in the chat, is there an easy way to tell the difference between the Acan species? Not so much by the polyps, but it's more of the skeletal structure and kind of how they grow together. Um, I'm not even the best at 100% describing it. I don't know if anyone, any of you guys on the call have a, a good, easy way of telling the differences in them. Uh, I still struggle with it. Yeah. 
so what I've noticed is that enchiladas, mm-hmm. they kind of look like a chalice. They like kind of like all merge together when other like a cans they'll have like spaces in between the actual heads. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know if it's a technical way of telling, but it, it, yeah, a, an echinata will look more like, uh, f- uh, you know, favites of some sort, whereas everything is kind yep. of really connected together, and there's like one, you know, piece of flesh that's actually connecting both sets of polyps, whereas uh, an acan lord will have separate individual polyps. Okay. And will actually extend its polyps out past the flesh, mm-hmm. a, obviously a lot more than an echinata will. Okay. Now, yeah, true, scientifically, true. I don't know exactly how to do it, but that's how I can tell by looking at them. Okay. No, that's a good tip. I knew it was something along those lines. I, I believe just by that explanation, I think mine are mainly lords then. But, um, yeah, that's a good way to do it. So it's almost like, um, I'm just Googling images, but, yeah, it almost looks like the heads are all interconnected is the Correct. best way versus the heads being more yeah. like a polyp. On it's just like, just like Google Orange Crush Echinata, right? Mm-hmm. And you'll see a gazillion different pictures of that. And and then take a look at any of your normal, quote unquote, a cans, and you can yeah. see a clear difference. Yeah. So I'm just gonna quickly pull that up on the screen for those people watching. But yeah. So there, there's the orange crush one, and now you can see it, it basically looks like all the heads are growing together. So. And that does mean, as far as stinging other stuff, I can't attest to that. Mm-hmm. I have a I have a, a favites that's probably oh two inches away from it. And it's already stinging it. Yeah, you can't even see that it's stinging it, like night or day. But then, if you look really closely down on the rock, you can see it's like sneaking the the tentacles across the rock to sting it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Little buggers, eh? <laughs> but yeah, Cruz and I were joking about it earlier how it's pretty much like a slow motion war happening in the tank. <laughs> well, I think that the you know the euphilia, like the like a hammer coral or a, mm-hmm. a you know or any of those kind of euphilias frog spawn type, whatever. They're quick. They, I think they actually have noses. I mean, they, they mm. like the smell. I don't know how they do it or how it works, but it's it's just wild to watch over the course, usually of a day or two, the sweeper tentacles start to come out mm-hmm. and then how they start to get longer and how they start to like figure out exactly where in the tank that other coral is and and uh, kind of hone in on it and, mm-hmm. and and just start stinging the hell out of it. And then they'll they'll be fine with it, the, you know, the tentacle getting ripped off by the other coral and just mm-hmm. like continuing to sting it too. Yep. I don't know if you saw the see if I still have it one photo from earlier, just how corals can kind of sense it, like that Montipora confucia, like this one. You can see it's growing out to overshadow the coral that's below it, and at the top of it, it's putting out runners upwards so it can try and overgrow the mind blank on the name of it, but the coral right behind it. Or the, not Gargonia, what the text is called. Anyways, yeah, but just how the different corals, like it will, it can tell what it has to do when it's trying to take out that coral by either shadowing it or different ways of attacking it. It's really crazy how corals have that instinct to sense or know its neighbors and to try and kind of deal with it to outcompete them. Um, At the same time, I don't really think that it actually knows that it's doing it. I think that's just like a natural thing that happens. It's like it grows up and then it spreads out like a plate. Of course. Yeah, it knows chemically. Yeah. It, it yeah. can sense whatever chemicals are being released and it knows someone's coming on its territory. Gotcha. Yeah. I have an interesting one too that was happening recently between, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, Sophastria that I have. Yep. And, uh, and a uh, Jedi mind trick, uh, Monopora and Dada. And uh, the Jedi mind trick was, you know, happy, living his life nice and big in the tank. And then, uh, you know, slowly but surely over the course of months, the Sophastria started getting bigger and bigger. And then as soon as it came within about probably, I'd say, a quarter of an inch or so of the Andada, Mm -hmm. uh, the Andada starts dying back about, you know, three-eighths of an inch. And then the the, uh, Sophastria keeps moving on, keeps moving on. Just keeps taking over more and more of the andata but what's really interesting now is the andata where it was just allowing itself to be killed has now curled itself up and it's decided to come up over the sophastria to where the sophastria can't like attack its live tissue on top 
um, and can only have access to the bottom where it doesn't matter. And now it's getting ready to shadow over the Sophastria and it'll win back all that territory. Yeah. It's crazy. eh? <laughs> it's fun to watch. I mean, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm not one of these people that go in and trim all my corals when they start to, to mm -hmm. interact. I've got a green slimer that went right into, you know, it was like you could see the collision course over, the, you know, over weeks, right, of a, a green slimer and a, and a pink bird's nest that I have mm -hmm. in the tank. And eventually, you know, they came together and they fought it out. And then the green slimer just kind of engulfed the, the whole thing and just kept on going. <laughs> it was just the coolest thing to watch. Just grows over top of the old skeleton of the other one. Yeah, and just keeps on going and putting off more, you know, uh, runners off of it, you know, and the other one's still living, and, you know, it's like, okay, you're going to live or die, but this is the way it goes in my tank, you know, cause I'm not going to get in there and trim everything back. Now, that said, if I've got a new coral coming on that's just going to be completely inundated by another coral that, you know, that I don't want it to grow in that direction, I will trim it back, but... Mm -hmm. There was um, one that I found kind of interesting in my tank. Where it was this one of the? It was a purple and a green acro that basically one branch grew in each other. They're fighting. Both tips and all the edges are turning white. They're dying. And then the flesh are growing over top of it. Now it's just kind of fusing this like massive little ball <laughs> around the two of both of the corals is kind of growing. It's just it's interesting to watch and kind of see what happens. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, I, I'm with you as long as one isn't going to completely kill the other coral. I mean, it's kind of interesting to let nature take its course and. As long as you're not going to lose it all, it's just one little branch and see what happens. <laughs> now, when it comes to fish, now that's another story that I'm having in the tank. That's one that's pissed me off with the supposed, oh, you know, reef safe with caution, heniocus, you know? So, yeah, which, which fish has been a bugger? The heniocus. I've, oh, got okay. th I've got three heniocus that I put in, and basically my ACAN collection in a week oh. was just, like destroyed. They're all sitting down the sink now, like probably 20% of them left. Yikes. Uh, can you tell me where you actually got the Heniocus or or the origin of it? Because there's actually two. There's, there's yeah, like, I know. Uh, yeah, I'm aware. Yeah. It's like kind of Russe, and there's one that's just a straight destroyer. <laughs> right, this is like this is the one that's not by way of identification. <laughs> I made that judgment. Um, uh, so, yes. And two of them are pretty good in the tank. One of them is just a dick. So... <laughs> just straight up goes after everything and uh so i just i need to trap them and get them out of there or spear them or something but uh definitely some of my uh my good lps are gone oh no fox faces uh, are another one that tend to be nippers on them i've, I've heard a lot of people complain about them going after a cans or whatnot yeah i fought a battle with a coral beauty six months it was fine and then all of a sudden it went rogue and just started heating everything tried to trap it tried to trap it finally broke down and spent you know the 50 60 dollars on an actual like acrylic fish trap after all the homemade stuff didn't work two days later after getting the trap it must have just died because it disappeared i'd never found it again <laughs> uh, <figured. laughs> there's um on, on that note i guess this is a fish versus coral wear for now but um my coral beauty is just doing a number on my purple whip and per gold plume and purple whip cargonians. It doesn't touch anything else in the tank, but he's constantly nips of the branches and the flesh on them, so those are slowly fading in my tank. But at least if I leave that in there, he's not touching anything else. So. <laughs> yeah, all my other fish are good, even my fox face. But I think the yellow fox faces are the ones that are the, the real culprits. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've got a magnificent, and he doesn't touch anything. So. Yep. Fish and coral warfare, coral and coral. It's just a battle in these little tanks. They look so beautiful, but, you know, if you actually pay down to the micro life in there, it's, it's ruthless. <laughs> yeah, but for the most part, if you just do SPS, that's why I just my, I have two bombies in the tank, and one of them was going to be dedicated to the best LPS and the other one to the best SPS. And now I think I'm like, you know what? I'm running out of room on the SPS side. I think it's going <laughs> I'm just going to throw in the towel on the LPS. Silly take them out. Yeah. It, it is much easier to just pick one or the other than try and appease well, there's everything. there's dead areas now, so I mean, I might as well go throw some SPS in there and just mm -hmm. start to just have the whole tank go that way. Yeah, I wouldn't take them out, pick but if battles. you lose something, then might as well just not replace it and put in more sticks. Um, yeah. So I had tried a jewel damsel because they say the reef safe and online says it's reef safe. Mm -hmm. No nah, man, that thing tried to eat everything. <laughs> so just straight up like got in there and it and it just started picking on a a, a chalice, 
And then once the cellist basically receded and said, all right, that's enough. It, I saw, so, so I'm like, all right, well, I'll take the chalice out. Started picking on some acros. And after the acros started picking on some zoas. And then I was just fed up. I'm like, <laughs> like two days of that. And I just, like, mm-hmm. oh, man. I'm right back. Oh, you're, you're cutting out about their narcosis. But yeah, a lot a lot of these things when they say like reef safe, I mean or reef safe with caution or any of this stuff, I mean you you have to take that all with a grain of salt, right? Because that's just a generalization. And every fish is different, right? Everyone has a personality. One could be the nicest guy in the world, the next can just be a bugger, right? You, you never know. It's like Russian roulette with what kind of personality or how that fish is gonna be. Like ones can never taste a coral, could care less. Another one, you know, they they've had some nips, they got a taste for it, and they could just destroy, you know, whatever soft in your tank or, or SPS like a green clown goby for instance, or yellow clown goby. Certain ones could care less, won't touch anything. Others they're just like ruthless and can take out a colony and just keep nipping at the flesh off of it, so it really is Russian roulette for a lot of these fish, especially the with caution ones. And that's that's the beauty of so many breeds being aquacultured now is they they have no concept of eating a coral or anything. So you get you have such better luck with you know all these varieties now being aquacultured. So I think that's an awesome thing that's happening in the hobby for many reasons. But you know that's one of the bonuses is typically things that you might be cautious with typically aren't going to bother your corals because they have no concept of it. Yeah, that, that's a good point. You've got far better odds of it being reef safe. And the other big plus, I mean, to me, there's less chance of a lot of different parasites and different other things I've been in contact with. They're usually in, like, sterile, proper environments and a lot less risk than other things. Usually, they're better handled to take stuff. You don't have to worry about them being a rough thing, stress through transport and how they're caught. Like, generally a lot better off and just healthier for your tank. Less risk and issue, in my opinion. Yep. A serial killer goby. I had a ser- on that note. I had a serial killer, basically a uh, tiger pistol shrimp before. That that I he took out three or four gobies on me. He would not befriend anybody. He just kept taking them out. Eventually sold them because he was a terrorist. But it was, yeah. C- c- certain creatures are just not nice. He was just a grumpy old guy. Didn't want to be friends with anybody. So everyone different personality, hands down. Takes new frags in his cave. Yep, he stole a lot of frags on me too. It was an expensive pistol shrimp. <laughs> They're so fun to watch, though. Yeah, you're like, oh, I spent fifty bucks on that frag. He's like, thank you, building blocks for my bedroom. <laughs> yeah, so what happened to that nice frag I put in? Oh, it's gone. <laughs> uh, had an emerald crab tear out the center of a porcelopora colony. Oh, that's a new one. I have... can go rogue. I've had those things go rogue before, I, and I don't think they do it intentionally. Sometimes I think they're trying to get at other things. Like I, I have them end up uh, in the frag tank. I have a couple, and they always pull um, polyps off of plugs. And I think they're just kind of cleaning around the base, and it happens. But I think a lot of times when you think they're killing something, they're trying to get something else out of it, and it's and, you know unintentional. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that could be. I mean, there is some I've heard that can get a taste for other stuff too. So. Like anything, Russian roulette, they get a taste for it. Or they don't have enough algae and other stuff to eat, right? A lot of these guys are opportunistic, and if they don't have food, their normal food, then they're going to start tasting other stuff to see if they can use to fill their little bellies. So if you're being a little skimpy on the feeding, you don't have enough algae in your tank, these are things that could potentially happen. Somebody said on there that they had a sail fin that would eat uh, green star polyps. Man, you should rent that guy. <laughs> Let him out. Could be a business. <laughs> Just, yeah, I'll it's get as much as a gem tang for that thing. I'll ship it right to my house. Who would shut up and take my money? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, take it. Um, with um, okay, GSP Green Star Polyps. Everybody loves that coral at first. It's like super bright green. You get nice motion. You can't kill it if you try. Awesome beginner coral. However, it will overgrow everything and anything. So yes. I mean, I have it in my tank, but it's on its own island, not touching anything. Because I still like the look of it. I still like the motion, but... It's the ivy of the aquarium world. Yep. Just totally. Don't or put... mint. Mint. If you've ever put mint in your garden, yep. it's the biggest mistake you've ever done. That's basically green star polyps. Yeah. Mint needs to be in its own pot in your garden or somewhere else. And GSP needs to be on its own little rock and its own little island or on your sand bed. Do not put it on any rock touching anything else. Like, you'll thank me one day in the future. 
or, or even that cloud. So I have it growing out to uh, my overflow mm -hmm. and getting ready to kind of start encrusting onto the back of the tank and start growing up. So you got to even watch your proximity to the edges of your tank too. Yep. Um, I, I've seen it actually look really cool when people do a full overflow wall in it, but then when it starts growing on the sides of the glass you look at, then that's when it can start to be a bit of a pain. Or it yeah. grows in, it grows into their overflow and they don't realize it. And then all of a sudden they, their overflows are overflowing. Oh, I didn't consider that. That's a sketchy one. Yeah. It takes over the teeth on the overflow and then it, basically you can't drain enough through the teeth. Ah, uh, yeah, that's actually, that could be a very dangerous long-term issue without if you neglect it. Well, the thing is, you don't know, right? Because yeah. it's working, it's working, it's working. Everything's working, everything's working. And then you go away for, you know, three or four days. Mm -hmm. Just enough time for it to close off that last <laughs> little bit. <laughs> that last little bit. Yeah, that'd be dangerous. And it does. That stuff goes crazy. I went away for one week vacation and it, it probably extended an inch and a half plus around an entire rock. I got back from vacation. And I was like, oh, I'll take care of that when I get back. I, you know, I'll trim it back and start to... I came back and it was like already too late. Like I already had a problem in one week's time. Yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess that's good. It shows a sign of a healthy tank. So I shouldn't complain too much, but now I just have a problem with it elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Yep. I was laughing. Rossi's reef. I sold thousands of dollars worth of GSP. <laughs> so I usually get those people's freebies. You're buying some other crawl. I'm sure you go rip off a chunk. Um, Josh was asking, will a torch and a rose bubble tip in close proximity cause issues? Probably so. Um, torches are very nasty. And I would, I'm guessing it would annoy the bubble tip enough that it would, the bubble tip would probably move. But I've never tried putting them close together. But I, I'm assuming that they won't be happy if they're touching. It'll probably push the, the bubble tip right next to your Walt Disney. Yeah, there you go. And then it will <laughs> climb on top of the Walt Disney for that spot and then suffocate it. So probably, probably pretty close. Uh, I had an open brain, a trachea. I think I found my Mandarin Gobi sticking out of the center. Then all gone. Yes. Definitely, they can potentially eat fish. I've seen certain brains eat fish, especially like a small fish or if it's sick or weak or something and it gets too close, it definitely can. Carp, carp, actually, carpet anemones are one that you definitely got to watch out for. Those guys are extremely sticky. Even like I've touched one, it like, sucks on you pretty good. But they can, if they're big enough, they will definitely eat fish and they can. Normally, healthy fish are fine. Like, they're smart enough they can get away from it. But if a fish is sick or weak or something, it can, there's a risk there. Dark, dark fish and other fish like that that get spooked. Mm -hmm. Any fish that gets spooked really easily will spook something that stings. And it's, you know, I mean, like a dark fish looks just like a silver slide. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep, exactly. Especially if they get scared, dart right into it. It's extremely sticky. I know from experience of getting one out of my tank how much it sticks to your hand. They're done for. Uh, SB reused. So on that, I think if, if I miss anyone's questions throughout the night, just ask it again. I apologize because it scrolls through and I usually don't want to interrupt if we're in the middle of something. So I try and scroll back up, but there's a good chance I've probably missed some. So no offense if I, I did, always just re-ask. Hey, Devin, I, I got to drop, buddy. So I really appreciate you having me on tonight. I, I thank you so much for the invite. And it was great uh, being able to share some of my thoughts with the, uh, your community. So thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on, Peter. And yeah, if you guys haven't seen him yet, Reef News Network. He has his own podcast. He does weekly on reefing. So definitely be sure to check it out. Get your fix when you're on the road or not able to jump on the videos. There you go. We, we got the, the catchphrase, which isn't that catchy, but I still keep trying to insist on making it happen. It's a uh, keep your eyes on your tank and your ears in the reef. So it doesn't nice. it doesn't naturally flow off the tongue. But, you know, it's, I'm working and I'm just trying to force it. It's filling that reef junkie fix when you can't watch videos or read forums. You just can listen to multitask. And then, or when you elbow deep in the tank and you know you got you can only have some earbuds and so it, it works on many levels but thanks again and thanks everybody that uh you know supports reef dudes that uh, said hi tonight i appreciate it so uh we will talk to you soon thanks guys yep no thanks so much for coming on on that note probably shut it down pretty quick as well um any last questions feel free to ask if you guys enjoyed it as always hit that thumbs up button if you're not subscribed hey. hit that button terrence thanks for coming Sorry, on be well. here for a couple minutes but mm -hmm. there you go no problem. Always good to have you, ma'am. All right. Take care. Okay. All right, everybody. Again, thanks for coming on. Hopefully you guys learned lots. Um, hit that thumbs up. Make sure you guys subscribe. Love you all. Got any questions? Reefdudes.com slash ask. And I will catch you guys on a future live stream or Monday's video. All right, guys. I'll see you later.